And uh, just to say thank you so much, uh, Carolyn, for the opportunity to, to be part of uh, the symposium. What a, an enormous privilege it is to speak uh, together with Scott Granite and, and Kathy Phillips. Um, Scott, I really appreciated um, the emphasis on uh, the stories that go along um, with these things we think of as, as illnesses, the, the, you know, the, the narrative, uh, and particularly when giving a talk just on drugs, uh, I want to emphasize that that's not the full picture uh, and shouldn't be thought of as, as the full picture. Um, and uh, also your tribute to, to Catherine Phillips, just to say, um, as, a, as a resident and as a, as a faculty member, eventually um, everything I know about BDD comes from literature that you wrote. Uh, and research you did both to, um, I think, to conceptually you know, define a disorder and make us aware of it, but then also so much um, useful, practical, um, clinically targeted research, which I really admire. So um, I'm going to try and, uh, sorry, I normally speak quickly. I'm going to try and use that to my advantage and, and to get us uh, a little on track. So my apologies in advance if we, if we go through uh, fairly quickly. Uh, but I just wanted to share some opportunities uh, for research and then hopefully um, things that may contribute to treatment innovations in BDD and in other OCD uh, and related disorders. Um, so uh, first of all, nothing to disclose. I'll show a couple of pictures of brand name drugs, but no, no financial relationships there. Um, so similarities between OCD and BDD, uh, most people, I think you know this, and you've, you've heard this, um, you know, they both share the, the experience of intrusive worries or thoughts or images. In OCD, it might be the fear that you hit someone with your car back at the corner. Um, in BDD, it may be uh, obviously a, a concern about uh, body appearance. Um, and these, um, these thoughts uh, contribute to um, distress and uncertainty that leads to action. Those actions may be circling back to check something, um, you know, reading the news reports of hit and runs, or in BDD, of course, checking the mirror, reading about corrective surgery, um, and both uh, lead to avoidance and uh, constraints on life. Uh, so in as much as there's similar neurobiology, there's similar pharmacology. Um, we think about serotonin uptake inhibitors, uh, as we heard uh, both from Dr. Crown and Dr. Phillips earlier, as the mainstay of treatment. Um, of course, uh, individuals may need higher doses, longer treatment times. It's really important to ensure that trials of SRIs are adequate. Um, and response rates are really quite good, uh, really, uh, especially in, in the BDD literature. It's exciting to see how many people benefit from this when the meds are used effectively. Uh, but of course, there are people uh, for whom it's not uh, quite enough. Um, uh, and the questions then are, you know, what do we do next? Or what do we think about next steps? And same thing again, Dr. Phillips mentioned in her talk. So if it's OCD, there's a, uh, there's a big literature, um, you know, never as much evidence as we wish for many things, but uh, certainly a lot of things to try. Serotonin receptor modulators, dopamine antagonists, uh, we heard about the antipsychotic medicines, dopamine agonists like amphetamine or some newer antipsychotic uh, medicines that uh, work uh, partially as dopamine agonists. Um, there's information on anticonvulsants, medicines used for epilepsy, uh, taken from neurology. There, uh, you know, many of, uh, we've heard many speakers now talk about um, glutamate modulators, like nemantine in particular, which is, is a, a, a medicine that I think is often very well tolerated and for many people very helpful. Um, we heard about opioids from Dr. Krim. And for many of these interventions, we know that uh, the benefits may actually be relatively quick. You can do a trial of these medicines in, in a couple of weeks or a month and, and have a sense if it's going to be a helpful strategy or not. Um, if it's BDD, uh, as Dr. Phillips mentioned, there's just not as much evidence. There, um, you know, the disorder hasn't been defined as long. There isn't the history of research uh, and uh, the breadth of it is as much as there has been with uh, OCD. Um, we heard that buspirone, uh, kefra, or levetiracetam uh, may be effective. There's some really exciting uh, work on, on oxytocin, on supplements like milk thistle. Um, uh, as Dr. Phillips again mentioned, um, you know, early studies of antipsychotic or dopamine antagonist uh, treatments weren't clearly helpful, though, though there may be um, newer versions of medicines uh, that are similar that are helpful. But really, we end up making treatment decisions based on comorbidity, um, treatments that we know might work for social anxiety, or for OCD, um, uh, or by analogy to disorders which we think are similar, again, such as those two. Um, so what I wanted to share today is a new opportunity uh, uh, to test potential medicine in, in BDD and in OCD, but, but with emphasis here on the gaps in BDD. Um, and that medicine is actually dextromethorphan. Um, so many people will know this, it's an over-the-counter medicine for cough uh, that you can get at any CVS and no need for a prescription for it. Um, and pharmacologically, it's a really interesting drug. Um, it's an NMD antagonist, so uh, much weaker than ketamine, uh, but uh, very uh, much similar to memantine. Uh, in terms of its potency as a glutamate uh, receptor blocker. Um, it also uh, more weakly has an activity like, uh, like duloxetine or venlafaxine, the serotonin norepinephrine uptake inhibitor activity. 
Um, and then it's also a sigma agonist, uh, which is a, an activity we know less about, but similar to fluvoxin, which is a, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, um, particularly indicated for OCD. Uh, again, you heard the Dr. Phelps mention that. Um, so the interesting thing about dextromethorphan is it's just never been studied in obsessive convulsive disorder. Um, however, um, there's an interesting literature in veterinary practice. So it's it's used uh, um, uh, as, an, as a medication uh, in horses for cribbing, so repetitive behaviors biting at stalls. Uh, it's also been studied in uh, canine uh, in dogs um, for uh, repetitive licking and grooming uh, disorders. And in both cases, it's evidence-based as, as a helpful intervention. So why, you know, why don't we think about it in psychiatry more? Uh, well, um, there's some quirks of the way uh, the uh, human bodies metabolize dextromethorphan. So in particular, um, uh, dextromethorphan, uh, which you can see this molecule here, um, is very rapidly broken down in the body into something called dextrophan, um, which uh, very rapidly then becomes uh, unavailable to the, to the CNS. It doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. Uh, and so when you take dextromethorphan very quickly, it's out of your system and, and not really available um, in uh, levels that might help for mental health conditions. Um, so, but um, what's known and actually really well established is that if you take medicines together with dextromethorphan that interrupt um, this metabolism uh, uh, that the body does that breaks down dextromethorphan, you can, uh, you can allow dextromethorphan to accumulate into levels that are actually uh, helpful and reach the brain and, and can have the effects you might wish. Um, so this is actually well established with an FDA approved prescription medicine um, for the neurologist use. It's a combo drug called New Dexta. And this is a combination of dextromethorphan plus uh, a cardiac medicine, an old generic cardiac med called quinidine, uh, which uh, inhibits metabolism and then allows dextromethorphan accumulation. Um, uh, this is FDA approved, as I mentioned, for actually uh, what seems a, somewhat like a psychiatric uh, condition, but an emotional disorder in neurologic patients, so uh, individuals with Alzheimer's or multiple sclerosis or, or um, ALS. Um, where they experience uh, pathologic laughing and crying as described. So, so intense emotional um, disorders, which don't make um, subjective sense to the person experiencing them, it can be disturbing. Um, what I find interesting is this, this combination medicine, the Nudexta, has also been studied um, in chronic pain conditions uh, and in depression. So conditions where there's a lot of interest in NMDA uh, antagonist medicines. Uh, and in both those conditions, it's actually uh, strikingly uh, more effective than memantine, um, which uh, again uh, is a medicine I, I appreciate in our city. And many of you have mentioned this, it's often very helpful. So um, uh, the sense that it might be equivalent or, or uh, you know, similarly potent and helpful uh, is really exciting. The reason that psychiatrists don't use Nudexta though is the cost is, is uh, really very, very high. So about $3,000 a month. Um, and so it's, um, it's really something that we uh, I think can use uh, generally with insurance only when there's the specific FDA indication for people with neurologic disorders. It's not something most psychiatrists have experience prescribing or using. So um, out of interest though, um, we wanted to consider if there are any alternative combinations of medicines that might impact uh, metabolism. And one of the few other drugs that inhibit dextromethorphan metabolism as potent as quinidine, which is used in Nutexta, turns out to be fluoxetine, um, which is a potent 2D6 inhibitor. Here you can just see graphs of, of um, dextromethorphan metabolism being slowed down by increasing doses of quinidine, uh, or here increasing doses of fluoxetine. Um, and the uh, the possibility of using fluoxetine to boost dextromethorphan and make it a helpful treatment in humans uh, is uh, what is the basis for the study that we wanted to share information about. So we're calling this the FLEX study of fluoxetine and dextromethorphan in obsessive compulsive and related disorders. Um, it's an open label crossover pilot study. That means that anyone who participates in the study will know what they're taking um, and will take medicines in two phases. Uh, one where they take just a low dose of fluoxetine alone uh, and the other uh, in which they take a combination of fluoxetine and uh, increasing doses of dextromethorphan. And so the order of that will be randomized. The use of a low dose of fluoxetine was the goal of, of getting a sufficient level that would inhibit metabolism and allow dextromethorphan to be active, uh, but also starting uh, fluoxetine at a low enough level that we wouldn't necessarily see the robust uh, benefit from that that we might get from fluoxetine alone, uh, as, uh, as we heard, uh, which often uh, requires higher doses. Um, we designed this study during the pandemic. So one thing I just wanted to point out is that there are no in-person visits. This is going to be an entirely uh, remote or telehealth um, mediated study. So anybody who's uh, in California could participate um, and uh, would involve screenings and, and assessments uh, uh, all conducted uh, via um, secure Zoom meetings. Um, we're looking for people who are between 18 to 65. 
uh, with symptomatic uh, body dysmorphic disorder or, or OCD. Um, and uh, we're looking for people who aren't taking medicine and who would, who would start taking medicine in the study. However, if you are taking fluoxetine alone, um, it would be you, you can participate in the study without changing your dose. So we would just ask that you continue taking the dose of fluoxetine you've been taking in, in a stable way uh, prior to the study. So we're going to we're hopefully going to enroll up to twenty uh, participants per diagnosis. So twenty individuals with BDD and twenty with OCD. Um, let me just check the time. I see we're just at 11 o'clock, so I'm, I'm going to hold on. There is uh, one other um, study, which I will um, just uh, put a plug for here, um, which is looking at um, the vestibular system, uh, and it's called Caloric Vestibular Stimulation for Modulation of Insight. So we're, uh, we've got a second study, um, which is hoping to explore um, some of the neural circuitry uh, that is involved in the degree to which people um, are convinced by something which uh, others may not find true. So when we think about deficits in insight or awareness, um, we are, are very interested in, in what the neurobiology correlates of that might be, and we have a study to explore that, and I'll be really happy to speak about that um, in the breakout rooms uh, this afternoon. So with that, I will turn it back to uh, Carolyn, uh, and uh, thank you very much.